Good morning, everybody. It's 10 o'clock. We'll give everybody about another minute to join and then we'll go through and get started. Okay, so it's 10.01, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Welcome everybody to the Preventing and Addressing Relapse presentation. My name's Erin Helms. Um, just a couple of uh, items. First, I am a person in long-term recovery, uh, and we provide recovery housing to women in the Cuyahoga County area. We also have a few different peer support teams that helps with people getting into treatment and um, and providing peer support. So that's just a little bit about me and, and where um, the my, my background. The other item to, to note, um, as I'm sure most of you um, know somebody out there who is sick dealing with a cold or a flu, it really seems to have, have come with a, a vengeance. So I was um, down a couple days last week and getting back to, to, to 100%, but uh, just want to make you aware I still have a little bit of that cough left. So if that happens, I will will press mute and, uh, and, and come back, but hopefully we should be good to go. So without further ado, um, these are the, the learning objectives we're, we're gonna go through and, and really get a firm understanding of, you know, what is relapse, um, but also, you know, how can we prevent relapse uh, utilizing recovery plans, re relapse prevention plans, and um, how to what what language to use also you know dealing with relapses is never fun for anybody so how to how to address those how, how to deal with those difficult situations um, and recognizing that that relapse obviously impacts that that one individual but can have impacts on other people living in the house as well and that really the need for emergency plans um, and and really overall how to create that supportive, healthy, um, and safe environment for for the people that that we're serving. So, first, um, you know, if you could really think about what does the term recovery mean, and it, it, what does that mean for you? What does that mean for for other people? Uh, when I first got started, you know, I there were um, I I thought recovery was you know the use of not using alcohol and or drugs um and and really that was you know my my first definition but over the course of you know the past 14 years um i have have learned and and you know things have have developed and and whatnot so recovery is the stage of a health condition in which a person has begun the process of treating the addiction often through clinical and or medical treatment uh, and supportive service and is actively engaged, engaging in steps to no longer use the substance. So that's the, the really um, broad definition of, of recovery. I think it's important that each individual um, I, identifies what recovery is and, and as important uh, that an organization identifies what does recovery mean and how do you define that. Uh, also, there are different stages of recovery. So early recovery looks very different from long-term recovery. Uh, behavioral choices are are different during you know both those early stages. In in early recovery, it, most people are trying to figure out how to have their life not be on fire you know 24 hours a day. Um, as we get into longer to more uh, more sobriety and and longer recovery, people's recovery or life really you know it becomes less chaotic. There's there's a there's more calm to it. Uh, not saying that there still aren't struggles, but um, but it's it's not those significant highs and lo and lows the, the way that we see for people in in those early stages of of recovery. Each individual's path to and throughout recovery will will look a bit different. Um, it's important to note that there's no right or wrong way of recovering and maintaining recovery. Uh, scientific evidence tells us that the most effective methods of treatment 
uh, and getting recovery include a combination of interventions. So it's not just one thing. Um, sometimes it's using medications, um, but sometimes people don't need medications. Uh, sometimes it's going to through a 12-step program. Sometimes it may be a faith-based program. Sometimes it may be a wellness program. So there's a variety of different recovery pathways out there. And there, just because one person has experienced success going one pathway doesn't mean that that's necessarily the right way for everybody to, to recovery or for the next individual. So um, recognizing that there, there are, um, that there are these different pathways and that it's important to help each individual recognize what is their, what is their path of recovery. The goal is obviously for a person to maintain recovery in the stage of condition for that for the duration of their life so that there's not that negative impact on their daily or daily functioning. With long-term recovery, some people may experience a remission of symptoms um, significant, significant enough that they and their treatment professionals um, may be considered cured. Now, that sometimes is, um, you know, there are other schools of thoughts that they don't that there that there's no cure for um, addiction or or alcoholism. Uh, so again, these there are these different schools of thoughts, and it's important that each individual recognizes what does that mean for for them. The one thing that we that we do know um, is it is considered long-term recovery that somebody once somebody has five years of continuous sobriety. Um, or maintaining con continuous sobriety, it's a it is possible um, for 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 people to get there. You know, see people every day in that that long term term recovery. But really, want you to think about what is it going to take for somebody that to to be able to get to that point of of five years, and how do we support them? Uh, a lot of that has to do with building a solid foundation. So. Residents living in recovery houses, that's what they're that's what they are there to do is to build that solid foundation. So the work that you are doing with folks is going to impact their their long term recovery. So when we go through and think about what are some of those barriers to sustain recovery? Um, first, uh, you know, unsafe housing. It, it it is very challenging, not saying that people can't maintain sobriety um, in, in unsafe um, housing, but it, it sure does make it make it difficult um you know not only the physically unsafe but if there's people actively drinking or using if there's emotional abuse if there's isolation if somebody lives by the by themselves and they, they really struggle with with um with uh isolation so you know that's that's one one part um homelessness it is it is difficult not again not impossible but it's difficult to maintain sobriety um if the person doesn't know where they're going to to sleep at night um or if if they're going to be um you know if, if it's constantly couch surfing or sleeping in shelters or sleeping um under you know in, in the park so homelessness can can be very difficult um so th so there's a variety of of different um areas that that are barriers to to sustain recovery um also untreated pain and untreated mental illness um that's something people really s struggle with because um they are because the things are, are are not equal so we really need to to be able to treat that that full per that that whole person so i would like for you to um put in the chat um or write it down on a piece of paper um why people may relapse and, and we're, I'm going to give you about 10 seconds to go through, or you can think in your mind um, why why people may relapse. But I want you to to go through and um, and and really try and think of why you think that why someone relapses may relapse. Okay, so sometimes people say um, they relapse because that, that the person relapsed because they're an alcohol or an addict. And while that may be true, um, that doesn't really give us a whole lot of um, that doesn't give us a whole lot of of to, to go off of. Um, there there is truth to the fact that we work with people 
who have substance use disorders. And, you know, sometimes it is part of somebody's experience. There are circumstances that people feel that their only coping skill is to use or drink. Um, and that that is one of the primary that that's, I guess, digging a, a bit deeper. So, yes, the person has ha, is a alcoholic or addict or a person with a substance use disorder is the proper proper language. Um, and, and that's why they they have have returned returned to use. It really um, speaks to that the person doesn't have the coping skills. Now, coping skills can can be found in a, in a variety of different ways. And that's what our job is, is to help people develop those coping skills. But e it doesn't necessarily have to, because we've had, you know, residents, and I'm sure you 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 know folks who, you know, things are seem to be going pretty well, the person seems to be doing pretty well, and, and the per person relapsed um, after they, after something good happened. Well, there there is that, um, I, when we think of coping skills, we think of only negative things, also learning how to deal when when life is getting better, and that may may seem a bit counter counterintuitive, but but it but it is the truth. So we really need to look at that wide range of of coping skills that that a person may need. So we're going to continue to 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 dive into this a, a bit deeper. So next, I want you to to think about um, how does your recovery home define relapse, specifically for alcohol, stimulant, de depressant. Um, opioid, marijuana, um, really any any drug of of, of abuse. So, um, how, how what constitutes a a relapse in in your recovery house? Uh, and it, it's important to 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 define this. So, if you could, if if you think about that, um, some of the reasons that 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 I've come up with are that that returning to use. So, um, that's that's what a what a relapse is. Um, on for for a substance, but we need to to continue thinking about this. Um, how does your recovery home define relapse specifically to medication assisted treatment? So think about um, you know this is a medication that somebody has been prescribed and that they are that they're taking to be able to um, support their substance use disorder, and yet at the same times we have had. Um, We've had residents who have have relapsed on their their medication. So some of the some of the the uh, the items that I had had come up with um, are you know not taking medication according to to prescription to to the prescription, um, advocate advocating for a higher dose um, from their provider in order to to be able to get high, um, asking to take additional meds in order to um, because of the combination using non-opioids um, to, to, to get high. So we have that K2 and the spice and kratom, that, those types of, of things um, in, in to, that people can use um, that, that sometimes um, people have, have reported getting high off of. Again, that, that you know, we would constitute that as a relapse um, and not intentionally not addressing um, if the, the, the initial dose has, has been too high. So, um, you know, each person is. Uh, we're asking them to to work with their physician or their their nurse practitioner to um, find that that right do, right dose. But if somebody comes in and and they're they're right from the beginning, they're they starting off with too too high of a dose. Um, overuse of medication, so you know, not taking it for a couple of days and then taking all of it at the or taking you know six doses at the same time. Um, really. Um, being that that idea of not using the, the medication as as prescribed and um, and not having the, the proper amount. So that's for our recovery house. That's how we define um, relapse specific to to medication assisted treatment. And because we work with people who have substance use disorders, sometimes they have process disorders. So things like gambling or um, sex addiction, those those are those pro process disorders. So being able to to look at how does your you know how does your recovery home define that those process disorders and um you know for for us it is if somebody um has you know has a gambling addiction and they start buying tickets or they go to the casino and spend their um and and start start gambling there so those are are some of the um so, some of the the items that that we would consider a relapse 
But again, it's important for your organization to to determine, um, you know, what what does constitute a relapse in in this area, and what is the plan. So we've worked with with residents who have had process disorders, and we have to take those, you know, just as um, we we have to we have to take note of those just as much as we do their their substance use disorder as well. So this here is is a graph um, that it came out you know in 2021 and it is was done by the Association of American Medical Colleges and it shows the um, and it was a a pretty um, pretty large um, research study that that was done um, but it shows the increase of um, non-prescribed fentanyl, methamphetamine, cocaine, and overall drug overdoses. But in every single category, there has been a, a, a rise of um, people either using or unfortunately um, in 2021, we passed um, over 100,000, I believe it's right, right at about 108,000 deaths of people dying from, um, from, from overdoses, which is just, I, I mean, tragic. It, it's it's absolutely terrible the um, the the lives that that have been lost to to, um, to to substance use disorders. So we're really still dealing with this um, opiate and stimulant or addiction epidemic that um, within the the greater pandemic. So um, not losing focus of the the work that that we're doing is is important, and we need to continue to to move forward in helping folks. Um, with with developing these skills and and being able to to maintain their their sobriety because um you know the the fentanyl has it can be a one time use that that um somebody has and um and and they're dead because of of that one time use and and I don't like talking like that and uh, at all but it that's really the 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 case so these are some of the when we talk about relapse prevention we're going to go through these these different areas so first prior to move in so it's important when you know when you're fir the first time that you're starting to to talk to a possible resident that during the um, application and the, the phone interview process or if it's an in-person interview process that you're setting the expectations and you're setting the the standard to what your recovery house um, operates. So we very much set that expectation that people maintain sobriety living in the recovery house. Um, have 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 people relapsed um, who have been our residents? Yes, but we want to, um, that is the exception, that is not the rule. So um, so right at the very beginning, setting those expectations, additionally, setting the expectations of how your house operates and what are the, what are, what are the supports and structures, structure that is going to be given to the, the new person moving in. So they know what to expect um, moving into the house. For example, we expect residents to follow treatment recommendations and to go to six meetings a week um, for the for the first 90 days of them living in the recovery house. Uh, that is that now we can't. There are exceptions to to that. If somebody's working a full time job, going to IOP uh, while they're in IOP, they're they're only expected to go to four meetings a week. But those are the types of things that that we go through with every individual and and set those expectations right from the very beginning. So everybody's on the same page. Additionally, as part of the application process it's important to to talk, to know what is going on in that person's life so things like you know where's the person currently living um are they you know are they couch surfing or are they coming you know directly from a, a residential treatment provider um what what current coping skills does does the resident have um what type of um you know what type of um are they coming from jail or or prison do they understand that that we don't operate off of this snitch type of of mentality that that um, that has no business and, and no place here? We expect honesty and transparency as part of the um, process of of living in the house. Uh, additionally, you know, talking about congregate living, that you're going to be living with other people in various stages of recovery. Um, so that those those are important things to to be able to. Um, to get out there, and also, have they had previous? Um, ha have they relapsed previously? And talking about, you know, what what were the circumstances that surrounded that that previous relapse or relapses? Also, then during the the um, phone phone interviews, as I said, you know, setting that expectations prior to to move in. Um, but 
and the one thing that, that we do note is, you know, COVID still is is going on. There seems to be a bit of a flu and cold, um, colds that people are dealing with now. Uh, this COVID was, you know, a, we had a bit more guidelines um, last year at this time with, with COVID, but it's still something that, that we talk to residents about. We, we still have information about vaccines. We still have information about washing people, washing your hands, um, being able to, to wear masks if you are sick, whether it's COVID or not. We still have tests for, for, for COVID in the house. So it, it's not nearly as much of a, a high priority, but it is something um, Im important to, to, to note. Um, these are the specific things that we still do. So um, taking the, the um, taking taking the temperature. If somebody's not vaccinated, wearing wearing a mask when they're not leaving the house, or when when they're not at the house. The the protocols, and then as I said, information about vaccines. So for the move-in process. So how are you going to make somebody feel comfortable from that very beginning that this is their house, that this is a supportive environment, that they are there to get well, to be able to make those changes? Um, what what action steps do you take to help that person feel comfortable? Um, and for, for us, it really varies from, from house to house. I have to tell you, um, we have one recovery house and, and there's um, we have a couple of residents who who are are living there? Who, who really enjoy cooking and baking and, and whatnot? And we had two new residents that were moving in the same day, um, just after um, or just before Thanksgiving. And they went through and did like a cheese cheese and cracker tray and got shrimp and cocktail sauce um, for the the two new residents because they knew it was going to be a little bit hectic with with two folks moving in right at the same time. But to be able to to make them feel comfortable and and welcome, they went through and did this. I'm not saying that everybody has to to, to do that, but um, but it is nice to, to be able to welcome people to the recovery house. Um, we have residents uh, that initially are assigned to taking um, the new residents to, to meetings. So what are those, those things that you, obviously there's the paperwork and, and that type of stuff, but what are those additional things that you're doing that the, that the residents or senior peers are expected to do in order to, to make the folks feel, um, feel at home and to, to start to, help them, them making making change. So um, let's see here. Okay, so from the very beginning, the, the one thing that, that we do as part of that move-in process is we create, we have emergency plans. So we have a form that, that folks feel, fill out um, to address both medical and mental health emergencies. So what happens in a, a medical emergency? Uh, what And with specific names, phone numbers, and um, you know what what it, the the insurance and um, a preference of of a hospital if if they have um, if they have a preference with a mental health emergency again we you know we want to be able to to, to take those things um, seriously and to be able to have that information when the person is of sound mind when they're first moving in so things like you know who's the person's therapist or psychiatrist. Um, what do they have a preference if they have a mental health emergency of where they go? And, and you know, with having options is, is fantastic, but being able to, to make sure that um, that person's wishes are being met, met, if at all necessary. And also, who are the support people that they would like to, to have called? We recognize that um, a relapse is a substance use disorder emergency. So we also have um, a substance use disorder emergency plan um, too. So it has, you know, what do you want to have, where does the person want to go um, to, in order to be stabilized? So um, is there a specific treatment center they want to go to? Is there a specific detox they want to go to? Um, who are the support people that are going to be called to, to help deal with the, the emergency? We actually call and check those numbers um, to, to verify that those are actual working numbers with living people that, that answer, that answer the call. So th that's something just, um, and we'll talk a bit about that um, again later on, but those are the types of things that, that you really want to address with those emergency plans. Because when an emergency happens, you need to be able to immediately pull up for each individual, okay, this is what the this is what this person chose when they were of sound mind to be able to and and being able to follow those um, that those persons that person's wishes right from the, that, that point in time. Is, is really important. So when a person is first moving in, um, you know, 
as part of living at the house, you have house meetings. Things, talking to, um, having topics when you're um, during those house meetings is, is something that we have found to be helpful. So talking about things like personal responsibility, um, how can you be selfless and how can you support one another? Those are just some of those topic ideas. Um, and I'm gonna take this a, a little bit f further um, we actually have residents go through and, and write down, you know, what is personal responsibility? Because um, as, as a resident starts thinking about these things, and we do this about, about once a quarter. So um, as the person's recovery grows, personal responsibility, um, what their definition is and how they see personal responsibility um, changes. And, and for, for, for the way that I understand this, um, part of the, nobody can make me relapse. Um, also, nobody else is in um, is responsible for for keeping me sober either. It is my personal responsibility to to do the action steps to to maintain my sobriety, and that's something that that we really work with residents in in these different areas of finding what is what is your personal responsibility, and how do you how how does that look like today? as a recovering man or, or, or woman. Then it also we talk about, you know, is this essential? Is this a need or a want? Um, in recovery, we're asked to do the next right thing. So um, is your next right thing continuing to stay home, stay home um, when you can, or um, g going out and being of, of service when, when, you, when you can? So those are the types of things that, that we go through and, um, and, and that we work through with residents um, and having those conversations. And that to, to, to me is really where the nuts and bolts of, of things are, is that um, is, is those conversations and having residents think about how that applies for, for them. So I just wanna take a pause for a second um, to check to see, are there any questions in the chat box that, that anybody has at all? Okay, hearing none, we're gonna keep moving forward. But if you do think of questions, I will periodically stop um, throughout the the pro throughout the presentation to see if there are questions, so we don't get too far down. And then there'll be time um, at the end. Yes, Aaron, uh, yep. just jump in here. It's uh, in the question box, not the chat box. Okay, thank you. In the question so, box. Yeah, so we had a lot of responses to what you had before okay. Uh, okay. around ten o'clock, but just FYI. Okay, thank you. So yeah, so any questions, please put in the question box. Okay, so recognizing the stages of stages of relapse. So um, I, I'm sure a lot of you have heard, you know, it, the relapse starts before the actual person picking up. So first we have this emotional phase. Um, and during this phase, um, a, a lot of times people aren't necessarily thinking about using but their thoughts and behaviors are setting the person up for a relapse. They're oftentimes feeling, they, they start to feel isolated um, or they're keeping their emotions bottled up. Um, sometimes they feel anxious or angry. Um, they may not be sleeping or eating well, but it's that, that emotional turmoil that, that, uh, that's going on with the person. The next phase then is, is that mental relapse. So um, in this phase, they're, they're oftentimes at war with themselves. Um, part of them wants to use, part of them the, them doesn't. Um, you know, the, the pe somebody may start thinking about people and places that they associated with, with using and, um, you know, maybe some of that euphoric recall um, or starting to think about the good times that they had when they were drinking or, or using. Um, and they, that person only remembers the, the good that came from um, from their substance use. Um, they're not thinking about the, the struggles and, and their actual addiction that, that, that they had. Um, and oftentimes during this, this mental relapse is when they start bargaining with themselves. And, um, and, and uh, unfortunately, if not stopped, um, they, they start that planning um, to use again. Um, and then the physical relapse is this is the phase when a person actually starts starts using. Um, it can be a one-time thing, um, that that first drink or use, um, and that that is if not stopped, it leads the person back into um, to, to regular use. So so that's really the the progression um, that. And sometimes somebody could you know it 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 can they the person can have that emotional and and mental 
relapse and and not physically pick up. And that's what our goal is, is to, to be able to recognize some of those signs and symptoms, to be able to stop it in its tracks so a person doesn't get to, to the point of, of picking up, up again. So um, these are just some areas of, you know, what the relapse risks are higher when. Um, and it's really a lot about change. So, um, you know, if there is um, conflict or, or loss, uh, grief can be really difficult and challenging. And, and again, I think you'll notice through through each of these, it's it, we experience these things and it's when we don't have the coping skills to be able to deal with how to um, experience our feelings and experience what's going on around us. So um, expo exposure to other people actively using, um, the loss of a, or change of job, housing, income, um, some of that structure. Fear is, is can be really problematic for, for folks. Um, pain, oftentimes um, dental or, or, or medical pain, but it can also be psychological pain. Um, medication changes, um, it decreases or ending of medications, or if a, a mental health medication doesn't seem to be working anymore, um, post-acute withdrawal symptoms, um, and then that changes in, in setting of level of care. You know, if somebody's been living in a level three recovery house and they go down to living in a level two or two to, to a one or go from residential into recovery housing, recovery housing. I mean, a lot of times people are, are in this very structured residential environment and then move into a recovery house and they have a bit of freedom that that change that um, that that can be a time when. So when a person's first moving into the recovery house, you know, relapse risks are, are higher at that point in time. So when we go through and think, what are some of these warning signs? Um, so what are the things that, that you can think of, um, of warning signs of, of, of relapse? And these are really, um, this is something that, that you should be able to, to name kind of right off the top of your head. So um, we're going to go through here uh, and look at, um, you know, if somebody stops going to, um, decrease in, in, in meetings or stop in quotation marks working the program, uh, mood swings, uh, recurring withdrawal symptoms such as anxiety or sleeplessness, sleeplessness. Um, you know, sometimes people self-medicate, changes in behavior, loss of interest in social activities, um, root loss of routine or structure, um, trouble making decisions uh, or making unhealthy decisions. Um, that's a big one. I feel like when, when people are, when you see that the decisions that they are making um, are, are not typical and are, are not healthy, um, that, that, that to me is a true tell sign for that that person is, is headed, headed for a, a relapse if they don't do something different. Um, withdrawing from people, not being honest. I mean, that, that is such a huge red flag. Uh, somebody starts lying because if they, if somebody is, is not being honest that you know, if whether or not they're being honest with themselves, but then they have that guilt. And if they don't go through and, and, and make it right, that guilt has a way of eating away at us. And again, going back to the lack of coping skills, we don't know what to do with these feel, these icky feelings that, that we have. And oftentimes, you know, are what has, what the person has done for, for many years has been their, their, their use. So, um, and obviously hanging out with people um, use, using or, or drinking friends, and that that that's a, a big one. So family or friends, um, you know, being around it in those early stages of, of recovery is is really challenging. So um, additionally, these this is just kind of an overview of that that er erratic or out of normal behavior choices or judgment um, increases in emotional liability and then physical changes. So um, abrupt changes in like weight or appearance. You know, somebody. Um, you, you know, typically they take a shower, they brush their hair, brush their teeth, that type of stuff. And you're starting to see them disheveled and, and whatnot. So those are the type of physical changes that, that we're, that we're thinking about. So, um, so, so we want to be able to go through and that, like I said, those are just kind of those broad, broad, broad categories. And as I said earlier, it's when, when you're, the changes out of the standard or typical that are not healthy for, for the person. So. As we're going through and, and we're working with folks, helping residents know what their triggers are. Now, being able to, um, to to recognize where are your triggers, because where your triggers are or what your triggers are, then we um, the next step is being able to help them find how are they going to deal with it. So, what are their coping skills? So, um, you know, so for example, 
Um, I know you all can read, so I'm not going to go through and read this, but stress, that's, that, that's a, a pretty um, broad topic. But, you know, when I'm stressed, that's when I, that's, that's a trigger for me. So what are some of those specific skills that, that we can go through and impart on the person to be able to, um, to get through stressful times? Because let's face it, you know, it, living, living today, there's, there's stress all around us. So how do we help residents learn how to, to deal with that? And going through and really making sure that, um, you know, e that each resident knows their, their triggers. Now, we are not clinicians. We're not here to try and write up a, a treatment plan or go through and do, do anything like that. But we are here to talk about recovery. So what for that person's individual recovery, um, you know, what is a um, what's a coping skill that matches from their recovery pr program to be able to help when they are triggered? Uh, or when they're experiencing a, a, a trigger. Additionally, then one of the um, so, some kind of broad topics of that anxiety, grief, um, isolation, the financial worries, changes at home, or that ongoing sense of uncertainty. Um, that that can be, um, you know, if there is something that that's out there that um, that, that a person is uncertain about, um, and 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 it really all speaks to that to that fear. So being able to have those conversations with residents um, is, is important. So this here is just a list of some, um, some, some hot topics um, that um, to, to develop that plain plan for distractions for cravings or triggers. Um, so things like exercise, watching a movie, um, TV, uh, you know, it, we have at multiple, uh, at many of our recovery houses, a rocking chair, that, that soothing of rocking back and forth for, for some time. Um, I, I know it says on their ice cube. Sometimes if, if people are um, it, it really, the, that they're in, in a state, if you put an ice cube in each one of your, uh, the palm of your hands and you, you close your hand around it and they have to, and I would recommend doing this over the sink, um, but they they focus on that and we'll, we'll have them go through and focus on the sensation and the, and, and the feeling and just really do some, some deep breathing as they're experiencing that. And sometimes that can get somebody out of, um, if they're in that, that real repetitive and, and they're, they're struggling to, to be able to stop. Um, making phone calls, doing some readings, music or, or listening to music or, or, or dancing. So those are some, all, um, some, some unique um, or some some different um, distractions to, to think about. There's also um, it is and uh, it's important to note that what is that person's re recovery pathway? So, for example, if somebody was you know um, on a wellness recovery um, pathway, maybe you know using that that exercise, going for a run, um, or you know maybe doing some some jumping jacks for for a bit of time um, to be able to help the, some of those thought patterns. Maybe if somebody's in a 12-step program, taking some some time for some prayer and, and meditation, or you know, there's oftentimes different things to, to be able to read in, in literature. So, um, and if somebody's going through a, a faith-based program, um, you know, may, being able to to take some time and reading from the Bible um, or calling their their pastor, um, you know, 12-step program again calling calling the person sponsor or somebody in their support group so it's it's really important that that a person goes through and they develop what are their their distractions and for staff who are working um you know one-on-one -on -one with folks or um in person rather with with folks not one-on-one -on -one, um in person with with folks helping the um Ha giving the, the, these options for a, a house manager um, or a, a, a peer supporter to be able to, to work with them. So the so the our job as recovery housing providers, it, as I see it, is to be able to go through and have somebody experience um, a situation, us be able to to talk about it, help them develop a sense of of coping skills, some some distractions for a person to be able to to use, um, and then the use utilize the coping skills to be able to get through whatever X, Y, or Z tough time was or um, um, struggle was. And, and that, because what we want to do is, is replicate as much of the real world as, as what we can, because at some point they will, be, will not be living in, in the recovery house with, with all of the supports of the recovery house. So we really want 
our um, the experience of a person living there for them to to be able to experience you know this is a struggle that I had this is how I worked through it this is what I did and to to be able to continue to do this and I didn't pick up and I and I didn't use and I'm and I'm developing this healthy way of living. So critical time intervention model is something that has been utilized. Um, it, it really comes from working with people with um, severe persistent persist severe persistent mental illness, um, but it's just kind of a a a, um, a a way to 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 a framework to to think about when dealing with somebody with a substance use disorder around relapse. So um, so identifying what are the when are risks high. So and and really most of the evidence say, says that it is when there are transitions. So when there's ch change that is happening as a person's life, that is when um, the the risks are the highest. So oops, sorry. Um, as part of as part of that, um, when to when when a person is um, experiencing a ch change or transition. What critical time intervention model says is to um, target them with specific case management. Well, we don't necessarily, so I know at least in my house, we don't provide case management. That's not something that's there, but we do reco re provide recovery supports. So when there, when there is a risk and when risks are higher, we know that we need to surround that person with a bit more support and ensuring that the person can um, have um, have what they need in order to be able to get through that difficult time. So, oops, I went the wrong way. Sorry about that. Okay, so any questions in the chat box? Question box, my mistake. Okay, hearing none, we're gonna keep moving through then, um, and we're going to talk about recovery plans. So, Recovery plans are are vital for um, you know a person making changes in their their life. So first, it's important to note that they need to be resident focused. So um, that's the part that I love about recovery housing. It is each individual um, gets to to decide what they want for their life, and we're here to be able to support them in that change. So it needs to be resident focused. So um, what are the goals of the residents? What are the obstacles? Um, how do we help residents achieve those goals? And as part of developing those recovery plans, don't be afraid to ask difficult questions um, because, you know, it's not just because you're not asking the question doesn't mean that it doesn't exist. Um, it just means we're not talking about it if we don't ask the question. So as the, the individual who is helping, you need to be able to, to, to ask um, those hard questions. This here is a framework that SAMHSA has developed. Um, these are the eight dimensions of wellness, and this is really where we work um, when supporting that that whole individual. And you you can see on here, you know, it's got everything from um, emotional, environmental, intellectual, um, occupational, spiritual, social, and financial. So that really is a whole person. And when how do how do we um, how do you how do you work with this? Because that can maybe seem overwhelming to to folks. So we go through and and we break it down um, that into um, each each dimension, and we have residents go through, and they rate themselves in each one of these areas um, of how they are at that point in time, how they're feeling about their. Um, we have them, like I said, a self evaluation of how how they perceive themselves in um, in the world, and we do this on a monthly basis. And we do it for two reasons. One, so residents can see progress that they're making um, over the course of the time of them living in the recovery house. And, and I gotta say, it's pretty exciting to, to watch somebody, you know, they do it um, the first week that they've gotten to the recovery house and then continuing to do it. And then at that like six month mark or nine month mark of a person living there, we'll bring out the, the one from, from the first week of them moving into the house and show a resident how much changes they've made um, over their life and how much development they that they really, um, how much they have developed over the course of this time. So it's good to be able to use for that part. Also, it is helpful to, to be able to use because um, sometimes residents don't know what to do. They don't know how to come up re with goals. They, they don't know what it seems overwhelming. And this can, can go through and break it down. So maybe financial is, um, you know, at a one and and 
social is, is at a one. So those are the two lowest areas. So, you know, they're lonely and they don't have any money. Um, and, you know, there are steps that, that we can take to help people making, making their life better. So this is the recovery plan that, that we use. And I believe in sharing the actual work that, that, that we do here. So um, I know you guys have access to being able to get these, these slides at the end. So um, I've put this out there. You, could, you can use anything that you seem um, that would be helpful for, for your folks. So, um, so you can see on here, um, first we come up with three goals per week. So what are, what are your goals? And then we need to, um, to break that down. And we don't just put, you know, lonely. Um, we, we want a person to, to really write out, um, I'm struggling with feeling, um, feelings of loneliness and I want to be able to feel more connected to the world. So the, what are this, the first column is what the steps the person needs to take. Um, how will those steps be achieved and, and are there any barriers? So really being able to, to write in that area there, what are the barriers to, um, to me being able to achieve this goal and how, how, how am I going to do that? And then um, the outcomes or progress towards the goal. So being able to, um, to track somebody making these changes in their life. Um, and we have, you know, what, um, what the due date is and, or when it's due and then the date that it's um, actually, actually completed because we want to be able to have measurable goals that are, that people that are attainable and can be done within a certain period of time. So sometimes goals are, are, are weekly. Sometimes, you know, it may be an, an ongoing, a goal that may take, you know, a couple of weeks or, or a month, um, to, to be able to, to, to be accomplished. And that's okay too. It's each resident's individual um, goals for themselves for their cha for change in their life. So thinking about goals a, a bit more, um, it's important to, um, to, to helping residents um, and this is just some, some, some examples. So physical activity. So we had a, a resident that um, was really struggling with, um, in, in, in winter time, was struggling with not feeling physically fit, um, struggling with her, her physical activity. So she had gone through and had developed a, um, had talked to a, one of her roommates about being able to do yoga. And they went through and set up um, a Zoom account and, they got on online with um, with a resident from a, a different house, and they did yoga. Um, the other person was a, a yoga instructor, and they did yoga together. So that was just, you know, it's just an example of that. There's there's a goal, and what are the action steps that somebody may may be able to take, and how can you um, work with them to to be able to find that. Um, additionally, we had um, we had another resident who really was struggling with that um, with with meditation so she as part of her um, recovery plan she went through and and took some time went to the went to the library went to central office um, in in the Cleveland area and she um, and she talked to um, three people at her the meetings that she went to about meditation books that that she had used and over the course of a week, she, you know, she got this, collected this information, and then she, she bought a, a meditation book. And then from there, she went through and set up time to, to, to work on meditation. Um, and, and then, like, and then she, then building, building from there. So that's just, I just put these on here to, to be able to, um, there's, there's a lot of different ways that you can go with things, a lot of different topics that, that people can um, focus on. Um, and, and we need to be able to help residents find their way, um, but breaking it down with those specific action steps for, um, for change. Hey, uh, uh, let me jump in. We do have a question real quick. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you go over recovery plans individually or as a group? It's from one of our viewers. Yep. Thank you. Great question. We do, the, we do recovery plans individually. Um, we each individual we meet with. So for the first probably three to six months, a person's living at the house, we meet with them weekly um, for, you know, half hour to an hour. And then um, after a person has been there for some time and, you know, is, is, is working and, 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 and whatnot, and really seems to have built that, that foundation of the recovery, um, then it moves to, to every other week. And then for our level one house, 
Um, and those are for folks who have at least a year of sobriety and um, have a good recovery foundation. They, um, we meet with them monthly to be able to do recovery planning. So another topic that we talk about in recovery planning is returning to work, um, returning to the workforce. So helping residents to, to rebuild their lives um, is is, is a, an important part of empowering them to finding that you know that new life that they're that they're looking for. So we we talk about um, you know what is it that you that you want to do, um, and and we have that those conversations of is this employment that you know is going that you're working towards for lifelong you know a career or are we looking for employment so you have some cash so you have some walking around money so you can you know just start the process different fo and it's different for each individual and at different times it's it's it it changes so um so we talk we talk about that we also talk about protection of yourself and others from getting sick unfortunately we're still talking about covid um we and you know staying home um and then we and as part of that um we're we're talking about the 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 self care that residents can um par partake in for um you know for changes in their life so um people um people have oftentimes you know of our folks have used alcohol and or drugs to be able to to relax um being able to find a good self care self care routine um is is important um we want to, and this is again something else that we talk about as part of the recovery planning. How do you find a self-care routine that um, that's that works for you, um, that that's actually helpful? So this is a, a cheat sheet that we have hanging up at all of the recovery houses um, that residents walk by every single day to to be able to see. Um, you know, this is um, this is the how important um self-care is so we try and um we try and attack it from a couple of, of different ways like i said the recovery planning um we hang up sh um hang up different messages and then we talk about it um at things like house meetings and what people are doing for self-care the other part is our staff really um we we talk about self-care and what people are doing for self-care as part of our staff meetings as well and what they our staff are modeling to the residents um living in the recovery houses so um, so self-care is an important part. Next, I want to talk uh, a, a bit about language um, and, and how much language matters. So we, our residents um, are, are some of the toughest people on themselves. They come in with a lot of shame and guilt and pretty low self-esteem oftentimes and how they, um, how, and a lot of times folks are really struggling with, um, with, with rebuild, re with rebuilding their their lives um and it's this perpetual um kind of um perpetual motion thing that we um a person doesn't feel good about themselves they they you know they they talk about themselves in a negative way and then they um they they take action steps that just supports their um this this idea that they're that they're not worth anything and that they're not not going to be able to get sober so when when we're looking at things we want to um, we want to use different language to to be able to, um, to to help a person make those changes. So how people are labeled can actually affect the way that we feel about um, and think about ourselves. Um, negative terms like junkie or drunk or psycho um, really um, that 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 impacts that that negative thinking that that person is is going through. So if you look at this study. Um, on the kind of the the light green is a substance abuser, and then the dark green is substance use disorder. So when we go through and we look at this, when um, and this is was a a study that was done called Beyond the Label. Um, but when somebody, so we'll just go over the first one. When asked if a person that who was a substance use abuser does how if they should get treatment, only 41% of people thought they should get treatment. But when they asked if somebody with a substance use disorder should get treatment, that number jumped up to 69%. So, so it does matter. And in, across each one of these, it shows that using the term substance use disorder versus substance abuser, uh, it matters. 
here's some some other exam examples of in, of looking at how we how we talk about things. So instead of using the term addict, now in a 12 step meeting, if somebody wants to say, "Hi, I'm Aaron. I'm an addict." That's absolutely their prerogative, and and that's part of their their recovery program. But when we're working with somebody um, in recovery housing, um, using the term person with a substance use disorder, um, or instead of using the term manipulative, maybe the person is resourceful. Um, instead of resistant, chooses not to or isn't ready for or not open to. Um, instead of using weaknesses, um, barriers to change or to needs. So those are just some, some things to, to think about. Um, we want to go from that deficit-based deficit perspective to a strength-based perspective. And as part of that, um, with recovery planning, we want to um, to make sure that it is person-centered. So person-centered planning is the practice of defining a meaningful life that centers around an individual's hopes, dreams, and capacity. The person-centered planning values the input of the person first. Uh, trusted people in that person's life are invited to contribute to the overall accomplishment um, or plans of the, the person's life, uh, but that individual is the the the, per, the um, person who's making de the decisions. With that, then person-centered language, when you're going through and working with somebody, it is easily understood. It's not clinical, just plain, simple English. Um, and again, it focuses on the, that person without labels, jargon, or, or judge, judgment. So when you're going through and doing recovery plans, it's just important to, to note the language that you are using when talking to somebody, and really not just re with recovery plans, in general, when we're talking to the folks that we're working with is using appropriate language, um, but specifically when you're doing recovery planning, really that, it, that it's person-centered. So we're going to deep, um, jump in a bit more to the, the structure and, and support. So how do we help somebody build support? So this is some some different ways. Um, first, um, through through meetings. So they can be Zoom, in person. Um, you know, go helping somebody find their sponsor, pastor, or mentor, depending on the recovery path that they are taking. Um, sometimes people can find support at religious services, um, and then fellowship is is a great place. Uh, and I don't know. I, I must have forgot to put this on here. But service work is the other place that people really can find support, uh, and it's also it makes people feel good about doing service work. They um, sometimes, you know, we have residents who um, go kicking and screaming to, to to doing service work, and then once they start start doing it, they really feel good about themselves and that they're starting to to give back to the world. Um, so, so I'm a I'm a big fan of of people doing doing service work, um, and it's one of the expectations that we set on the front end that there's one hour of service work it, per for your recovery community per week, um, one hour for the re the recovery house, and then two hours in the greater community per month that, that all residents are expected to do. So the it's, we have found it's important to set those expectations on the front end and then hold people accountable because it does make such a, a difference. We also want to, as part of the, the recovery plan, is helping people find things to do. You know, the um, residents, Boredom can be, can be quite a struggle. So having that kind of go-to list of what what residents can do and helping them to to find what is it that they enjoy doing. So um, you know, for 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 myself, when when I got sober, I had a lot of time on my hands because I wasn't um, out there chasing things and 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 using and 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 whatnot. Um, and I and I was bored, and I had to figure out how to what what is it that I like doing. Um, you know, I the the fog had started to lift and, and whatnot, and I and I didn't really know what are what are my hobbies. What do I what do I like as a, as a person? So um so as part of the the recovery planning, we want to make sure that we're not forgetting that that fellowship or fun part of of life because I believe that if somebody's not enjoying the recovery, they're they're not going to stay sober. So as part of that, the, the technology can can be really helpful. You know, we're coming again into to winter here in Ohio, and um, technology it's it's something that one we we need technology so people can can be able to con connect if you know if they're not feeling well to be able to get on a Zoom meeting or if we have these increases of a flu or COVID unfortunately. Um, so how can we help folks 
with connecting to with like through Zoom meetings, um, being able to have devices available and having working knowledge of how to um, how to connect to Zoom, how how to be able to to do that type of stuff is, is really important. So as a recovery housing provider, making sure that you are able to provide that technology and the instruction that goes along with it to to your residents is, is really helpful. We want to make sure that residents are moving from that chaos to calm. So every week, our residents complete a weekly calendar um, that they and they're expected to stick to the calendar. Now, you know, sometimes they go through on Sunday evening, get their calendar approved, and you know, maybe Wednesday night their sponsor calls and says, "Hey, tomorrow a bunch of us are going out to dinner before we go to the meeting. Would you like to join us?" And those are things that that we do approve, but we ask that the resident. Um, gets that approved by their house manager and then updates it actually on their their calendar. So that's just it's just a, a tool that that we have found to be helpful, but it helps put some some structure into a resident's life um, in in moving forward. Also, um, we do we do daily check-ins. So I know the print may be a little bit small, but we ask the person, you know, what what meeting did you go to today? What and what did you get from it? We don't need to know all the ins and outs, but we want the person thinking about what about what they got from the meeting. Um, what did you do for service work today? Um, what else did you do today? You know, did you go to school? Did you go to work? Um, did you meet meet with your kids? Um, what are your plans for tomorrow? And then, um, did you talk to your sponsor, pastor, or mentor? Um, any insights? Uh, is there anything that you need? And what did you do for fellowship? So, um, so those that's what what we utilize, and and we write it down. Um, so that there's there's a record of it, but we go through every day and, and we check in with with the resident, and that plays two. There's two reasons for that. So one um, one it is providing that you know that that relationship between the house manager and the resident. Secondly, it is we're putting eyes on a resident every single day. So um, you know we're getting close enough to be able to to talk to the person. So um, not saying that somebody couldn't have used um and, and come back into the recovery house but 99 percent or there's a good chance that if somebody has has used or if they've drank something we're either going to smell it or be able to tell from their their behavior um that something's going on so um we want to be able to catch that very quickly if somebody has experienced that type of symptoms um and then I, I think it's always important when we're when we're talking about recovery planning that that we teach people how to ground themselves um, and this is not something that that's clinical whatsoever. Um, and there's different grounding techniques, but this is just one that that we have found to be helpful. Um, and and when we're going through, we want to be able to impart those skills on, for residents. And this is the the type of coping skill that that I'm talking when I said about earlier before finding those coping skills for residents to to be able to utilize. So um, it you know it doesn't take long. Um, we have the per, you, this grounding te technique is um, they they say five things they can see, four things they can touch, three things they can hear, two things they can smell, and one emotion they feel. And it just takes the person as they're going through this, and it just it it grounds the person. So those are the types of of um, ideas that that we want to utilize when we are when we're working with residents in this relapse prevention um, from this relapse prevention perspective. So again, questions, anything that we've we've got? Okay, hearing none. Um, so we're going to get into the recurrence of symptoms. So a if about relapse plan. So um, so the term I so we have used the term relapse and, and I still use the term relapse. Um, and it's really a recurrence of symptoms is what we are what the person is experiencing because you know this is a sub they have a substance use disorder and if somebody has maintained sobriety for for some time and they re-experience or they have a recurrence of their using symptoms um, and they've started to use again um, that is what we constitute a a relapse so first as i talked about earlier on those emergency plans so this it's a we call it a a, a relapse plan is is really what it is so we created on the day of move-in um, actual numbers and places a person can go. So we don't want to have to make um, those decisions for, for a person, but we need that person to be able to have some place that they can be safe, that they can be stabilized, um, to be able to 
to, to protect that person. Sometimes it, you know, it may be a treatment center or, um, you know, a hospital. Um, we have, fortunately in Cuyahoga County, we have a diversion center. So that may be a place. Sometimes it may be with a sponsor or pastor, mentor, somebody who's in that person's life. Sometimes it may be a family member, but that person needs to, to be able to, to address that um, and to identify where is it that they um, are, are able to go to be able to, to, to be safe and, and, and supported. Um, during that time where we don't necessarily ask the person, um, we don't ask them to take all their stuff with them. We ask them to take an, you know, an overnight bag with, with a couple of days worth of, of clothes and, and their toiletries and, and anything they, they may need um, for, for that couple of days, because it's going to give us some time to be able to go through and, and look at what's going on with the situa situation. So, um, and to be able to create a sample plan. So this is a um, this is a plan that that um, a sample plan that that we would have created. So talk to the resident about only going to meetings. Um, we have a resident if they have experienced a relapse that they have to talk to each of the other residents living at that person's house. And you know what insight does the do their residents have? Sometimes the the peers of the residents living in the recovery house are better apt and can see what's going on. Um, with a person better than we can. They also have to talk to um, either their sponsor, pastor, or mentor um, and have a discussion about what they have seen. Um, you know, maybe it's also re-engaging or engaging in therapy, um, whether it be grief therapy or trauma therapy or um, in, just individual counseling. Um, but oftentimes it, that's a, a component of the plan. Um, Maybe that we need to look at a medication adjustment if the, the medication seems to be off. So a doctor's appointment, um, we, we typically um, increase the service work that somebody is expected to, to do. Um, we, we need to get them connected into, um, into the, to, to the world. Um, we look at distractions. So, you know, as the person started working 60 hours a week and, you know, no wonder that they're, um, that they've had a recurrence of symptoms, work has become their um, the, their main focus, um, or family members, or you know significant others. People sometimes get into relationships, and that's the only thing they sleep, breathe, and think about. So um, there is a restriction period again. So um, when they first come in, there's a restriction time. If somebody's had a relapse, they go back in, onto that restriction time, and um, and then as the person has has accomplished steps. Their, their restriction lessons, but um, they initially come back in on that, that restriction. Uh, making phone calls, again, it's a lot of it is about being connected and that fellowship, that the person is having fun in, in recovery, that they're learning how what is fun for them. So that's just an example of a sample plan of if somebody were to relapse um, and it's their first relapse, that might be some of the items that we write down and that, that we're going through and, and having the person do um, and if they're willing to to reengage and they want to continue living here, we want to be able to help them with making um, with making changes. So as part of that, um, we want to look at what areas of outside port support can a resident use. So um, so that's what when um, I had gone through and um, and and had had said about the you know therapy or medication changes, like that we need to be able to look at that whole person to to making those changes. Um, also, what is your um, what is your organization's policy on reengagement? So, or and if somebody has relapsed, I know organizations out there that have said if you relapse, you can reapply in 30 days. Um, other organizations that ha have um, you know that they ha have are so our organization, like I said, if somebody has relapsed, they have been honest about it. They are um, they're. Um, willing to to make changes, we will have the person continue to uh, you know come back to to the house. So um, for us, it's really an individual basis. Now, if somebody has come to us and within the first week of them living there um, that they they have relapsed, um, sometimes that you know that person may need um, a higher level of care. That they've been here for such a short period of time, they they they've relapsed. Um, you know. That, that may be the case, but we will go through on an individual basis and, and take a look at it. If we ask somebody to go to a higher level of care, like a residential treatment, um, we will hold somebody's bed for them. 
if it's more of a, um, you know, we operate level one and level two recovery houses, and we've, um, it's, we have asked, we believe that the person needs like a level three recovery house. We won't hold the specific bed for somebody, but we will hold a bed. We will have a bed for them after they've gone through um, and completed, um, after the other organization feels that they're ready to step down from that level three, um, we will we'll, we'll have a bed for them um, to, to come back to a, to a level two. Sometimes the person comes back, sometimes, sometimes they don't, sometimes they make different choices. Um, I, I click, quickly want to go through and, and talk a little bit about multiple pathways. So we we've that term's been around for a while, and we um, you know we we talk about it, but what does that really mean? So we have your traditional 12-step re, um, recovery, and it has been you know I think that's the reason that we say traditional uh, because it's been tried into true and test. I can't think of that term. Um, it has been tested for many years to be a very practical way and possible way of people finding freedom and recovery. So it's something that, that has worked for, for, for many folks. Um, we also have faith-based programs. You know, maybe the person um, is, is, is religious and they're, they're struggling and they're, they're missing that, um, that faith component or religious component um, because uh, to, to their recovery. So maybe it is helping a, a resident engage in something like, um, you know, celebrate recovery or, getting to a specific um, religious organization in, in the area. On the other hand, on the exact opposite end, then we have smart recovery that has no spiritual component or religious component what to, whatsoever to it. But you know what, maybe that's what somebody needs. Maybe that, that um, you know, they're an atheist and they've been, they've been trying and it just hasn't worked. And maybe smart recovery is, is what, um, is where it's at for somebody. For, for me personally, that wasn't my pathway, but that I, I I have different experiences than what our residents do, so so that that's an option. Um, we also have Life Ring, um, that's a secular organization um, who share practical experiences and sobriety support. So that's something that ha has kind of come about um, for for folks to be able to to work with. Um, it's they they really um, they they work from the pre premise of own your own personal recovery. So. Um, so working with a mentor through the Life Ring program. Um, for women, there's um, Women for Sobriety, and um, this is being able to um, specifically work with some of women's specific um, specific issues or or needs so so there's uh, the main uh, those and those are just kind of a highlight there's refuge recovery there's 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 tons of other um programs out there there's Russell brand recovery like there's there's a lot of things out there my point is is that residents need support in sometime changing things sometimes it just it hasn't worked for the person so try something different um or trying to do it different may be the the solution the person's been looking for also um I wanted to, to to mention family and friend support groups. So, for for a couple of reasons. One, um, first is fa our residents sometimes have family members or friends who are who struggle with substance use disorder. So maybe one of the things that's missing in a person's life is that they're not dealing with their own codependency. Um, so maybe they need to get to you know an Al-Anon meeting themselves um, to be able to address some of some of those issues. On the other hand, sometimes family and friends really struggle um, with um, with somebody's substance use disorder. So, uh, being able to offer those resources to family members of your residents can can be really helpful um, because, as we know, this is a family disease that affects all all parts of the family. So, just something that that I think it's important to note. Uh, and I would say, you know, um, we've definitely have re have had residents. Who have really struggled with their their family members and them, um, the resident themselves going to a um, an Al-Anon meeting or an Al-Anon meeting has sometimes been proven to be really beneficial. So when we're looking at the, those needs, that that's something to to um, to think about. Um, so again, going back a little bit to the seeking outside help where where necessary. So you know, I very much believe in in recovery programs and the value of recovery programs. But as recovery housing providers, we are here to be able to help that person, really that whole person perspective. So recovery programs can can only do so much. I mean, in in 
all of the recovery programs I know, they, you know, they talk about not being the psychiatrist, not being the banker, not being the attorney. So those are those, um, those outside supports. So it's just, I, again, I just wanted to, to note that, um, you know, our job is to be able to help connect residents to that outside support. Um, additionally, then, you know, sometimes medication is, um, is, is something that uh, has been missing. Somebody has had multiple relapses and, you know, and really is struggling. Maybe looking at, at medication assisted treatment um, for, for that person, whether it's for, you know, a, a time limit period of time for somebody to be able to stabilize um, or for, for, for forever, you know, sometimes somebody, some, a person may need to be on it the rest of their life. If they're able to find a medication that works and they're able to make changes, that's what they, um, that's what the recovery house can do to be able to support them. So thinking about what is abstinence for our organization, somebody's taking a medication as prescribed, not abusing it, not getting high, not nodding on it, um, that, that is considered abstinent. Um, medication assisted treatment, uh, you know, you, you've got Suboxone and, and Methadone is two of them. We also have Vivitrol or, or Naloxone. So, um, so those are, I'm sorry, not Naloxone, Naltrexone um, that, that somebody may be able to to take. So being able to to look for those other uh, or medications that may help that person is, as I see it, our responsibility to to connect them to the information and to connect them to the person that can make those um, those decisions. Uh, and you know there are some barriers for folks with with MAT. You know there's there's still some stigma out there. Um, the the um, when somebody's trying to initially find the dose, somebody can can appear to be nodding out, and that 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 can be a struggle. Um, there there still is a bit of a lack of understanding of of medication assisted treatment. So recognizing that somebody who's on MAT are not only are they facing the um, additional stigma of having a substance use disorder, but then this additional stigma that that's sometimes associated. So I urge you all to be that that place that the the recovery house for that to be their home that they feel accepted and that they can get the support that they need. Um, and and as going through and and doing that coordinating with the prescribing physicians. You know, I'm I don't pretend to be a doctor. I'm not going to ask uh, um, that a doctor um, take my you know, recommendation or, or anything like that. But I do have, a, we do have information as recovery housing providers that, that could be helpful to, to share with the person. So, you know, if you're seeing that the person's not sleeping for, for, for many hours um, over the course of the night, or they're, they're waking up with, with using dreams or night terrors, um, or they're, they're struggling with, with lack of motivation and they're, they're not moving forward in their recovery program. Those are things that are important for a physician to, to know. So being able to have those d discussions and have that, um, that release of information so you can share that with the, with the, the, the prescribing office, um, that, that's, that's important. Um, and then preventing of diversion of medication. So that was one of my biggest fears is that, you know, medications were gonna be all, the, all over the place. It, th there is um, there's a pretty simple, easy way to to go through and 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 do this utilizing a safe and having the proper protocols in place to um, to to really help a resident um, getting their 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 medications, having either time set up for them to be able to access it um, or having having those protocols in place that that meet the needs of the residents living in your house. So. Um, but but being able to have that safe to have the medication locked up is is key. We per, our organization we bought a gun safe um, to to be able to um, lock up the medication. It was something that was that we found to be best, um, and it, and it's worked well. We've we've provided MAT support for residents for more than five years now, and um, and and and, it, and so far so good. So the one thing to, to think about though is what if the resident's just not in the right place? They've had a relapse, um, you've worked through that, um, but it's just not the right place. Um, it's important to, to document um, you know, what actions have taken place that you've arrived at this decision. Why is it not working? Um, and again, what documentation do you have to back it up? Um, so what options can you offer that person? You don't wanna say, you know, this isn't working, you gotta go pack your bags and leave. Um, what, what other options? Why isn't it working? Where, where else can, can somebody be referred to? So um, 
you know, a lot of times we think it's because somebody needs more support. We've had instances that somebody's been with us for a while, um, you know, and and for whatever reason things have stopped stopped working. The person's um, it's but it's just not working. So we we'll go through and we'll we'll talk to the person, say, you know, this is the last we're we're ending your lease. This is the last month that you'll be living with us. Um, here are some some different options for places that that you can um, that you can look at going to. We'll work with you on being able to to do that, um, and, and we we go from there. So, um, but it's a, I just thought it was important to note. Sometimes it's just not the right place, which um, which can happen. Uh, the other part to to think about with a relapse is the other residents. So how do you work with um, through with privacy? So the the individual's privacy you can't share one resident's information with another resident's um, that's why as part of our um, sample plan we have the residents talk to each of the um, talk to each of their their housemates um, and we feel that that's a very important part um, for the person to to be able to gain the information and then also uh, to be able to um, they can they can share what they feel is appropriate with the, the other residents. As staff members, we can't share that information. So um, so we do, if somebody asks a question, we have a pretty boilerplate answer that, um, you know, if this information, if this is not about you, just the same way that you would want your privacy respected, we're respecting that individual's privacy as well. So, um, so, we, so we talk about that. But we do, but we also have, honest conversations with with other residents so we talk about you know what feelings are you experiencing um you know these folks learn to um that they're, they're living together they trust each other they've become friends so you know what does it feel like what um what are you what are you what are you struggling with and how can we go through and support you um just because somebody has re relapsed doesn't um necessarily we haven't seen this ever um, this whole other group of people going out and relapsing because they've seen somebody else relapse. Um, if anything, it's motivation of that individual not wanting to, um, our, our other residents not wanting to to experience that same that same process either. Um, and then, um, what insights you know can that person? And we we talk to to the residents about being kind and compassionate, um, being able to share what their feelings are to being able to to help somebody. Uh, and then if the person does not return to the house, uh, you know, it sucks sometimes. And and residents experience some of that that loss of somebody that they've started to become friends with and, and whatnot. But we talk to them, um, we have those conversations about, you know, the reality of the situation. You know, yes, you've lived with the person for the past three months, but, you know, you're 28 years old. It's been three months. So while you are friends with them, you know, a little bit of... Um, reality of the situation. We also, this is a good opportunity to talk to residents about developing friendships with people who have longer periods of sobriety. Um, you don't want your entire um, support group to be all of people that have less than a year of sobriety. So how can you work of um, not only your sponsor, pastor, or mentor, um, what are the other people in your life that you can start working on developing those, those relationships? And that's something that we do ongoing but but really, in if there is a, a relapse, it's a really good time to um, to revisit that. So the one thing that I want would like for you to think about as you're walking away from today, what does the very best safety net look like in your recovery home? So we've talked about a lot of re, uh, prevention, um, relapse prevention. We've talked about recovery planning. We've talked uh, uh, quite a bit about what happens in the event of an actual relapse. Um, so what does what does that safety net look like for you for your residents? Um, so I know that we're getting kind of low on time. So there's a if there's any questions that anybody have, I'm I'm happy to um, to go through and answer. Um, yeah. There are a couple. Yep, go ahead. We got a couple questions. Uh, okay. And first of all, uh, several people want to know how how to get the forms that you showed earlier. Um, can they reach out to you and uh, you can, yep. 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 So okay. you can, so they are and and being able to say which form it is, but they're they're Word documents. So I and I do, and I purposely don't put our like logo on there and don't put them as a PDF. So if there's something you like and then something you want to change on it, feel free to change whatever or 
just take take whatever but i'll send you the blank one so you can put your own logo on it and use it yep um another question is um uh do you feel like level one housing is a need in ohio right now there are issues with zoning and city limits and have there have been difficulties with having the community back up to recovery housing and the need for it can you comment on that a little bit yes so two things one yes i do think that there's a need for level one recovery housing and some some really kind of specific level one housing um women or men with children um you know a lot of times folks don't initially have their their um their, their children in, in custody, uh, I really would encourage them um, to be able to, you know, as somebody's working through that process and regaining that that custody, um, you know, they, it can be really helpful to live in a recovery supportive environment. Also, the other day I was having a conversation. Um, we have folks who are, um, we have an aging population. So um, that 55 and, 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 and older. So um, if it could be on a, you know, a, some people are on a fixed income and being able to have recovery housing um, that is supportive of their recovery. You know, maybe somebody has a couple years of sobriety. Um, I, I very much believe level one should have, residents should have at least a year of sobriety. I know the standards say six months. Um, for our organization, it's at least a year. Um, the person has to have built up recovery capital. So yes, I do believe that there's there very much is a need. And if there's two ways to do it either talking to an organization you know there's some really great large organizations through, throughout the state um, maybe they only have level two and level three recovery housing and you're looking to provide the level one house talk to them and say you know i'm opening up a level one house i'm gonna have five beds the one thing about level one though is i believe it should be individual bedrooms or individual apartments um but definitely individual bedrooms you know somebody at 18 months of sobriety isn't going to share a bedroom so level one it, like i said in my opinion it should be that's not a standard that's my own personal opinion um and then also looking so with level one is actually the best um a, 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 the best place to to fight against nimby issues and um and fair housing issues because level ones are so much like oxford houses and they have done a tr Oxford houses have done have taken things to court. So you're it's the the most closely related um, are those level one houses. And there's if you go to the Ohio Recovery Housing website, there's a lot of information on there about the different um, um, the 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 different lawsuits and and whatnot. So things like can't have more than one recovery house within a thousand feet of each other. Nope, that's not true. Um, can't have more than five unrelated adults. Nope, they they've they have fought through virtually every um, issue that's been done out there. Not saying that an or that a city won't try and do it, but going prepared to the meeting with those different um, um, with with those different lawsuits. Cities, I, I mean, some of them don't care and they think that they're just going to scare people away, but they're being prepared from a legal perspective is important so like i said on the ohio recovery housing website the resources page has uh, all of the different lawsuits that have been um that that are out there that um show the rights of recovery housing operators and really the, it's the rights of the recovery housing residents that that where, where the rights really coming at, come in at so i hope that that answers your question um, I just want to make sure that you, uh, before we leave, it's almost 1130, um, yep. that you go to your contact slide. So, yep. So, the... I, I, yep. So I'm just going to go through this. Um, I had put, I always want to make sure I have enough information. Here are some different information about the de-escalation and active stages of lift, listening. It, they're very self-explanatory, but I, I wanted to make sure people had those on there. So I, um, but here is my contact information. So Aaron at the Woodrow project .com. My phone number is on there. Um, I would say texting is perfectly acceptable. If you shoot me a text message um, with your e or send me an email um, with your of of what documents you're you're looking for, I will work on getting those to you um, by by the end of the week. Super. We don't have any more questions at this time. 
Okay. Well, thank you all so much. I, I it's been great being here with you for the for the past hour and a half. I hope you took away some good information. And uh, and I know you know for for folks showing up to join training, you're really trying to to do the best you can to to su support and um and and really make changes in in helping residents making changes in their lives. So um, hopefully you found some of the information to be helpful and um, t being able to to take some things back to. Uh, to providing that very best safety net that you can for, for your residents. Thank you.